Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And seeing the long-term impacts of climate change, for being with us. As we look around the globe for those thousand best practices on the Emerald Planet TV, we're also looking for the organizations that are making a change as we move through the 21st century. And one of those is the United Nations Association of the United States of America. And we have someone that's coming on, it's going to be talking about the Sustainable Development Goals number eight. This is Lady T. Thompson, uh, Global Goals Ambassador, and also she's the Executive Director of what's called AgroBiz, both very important organization. Lady T, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you so much for having me on. It's a privilege and an honor for myself. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, looking at the UNA USA, why is it so important for you to be involved with this association? Well, I try to be involved with anything that's that's improving humanity or advocating for basic inevitable rights with you with with humans. And so it's a privilege and honor for me because I am helping other individuals be the best that they can be. Oftentimes you have marginalized communities that can't be the best that they can be because they don't know because they haven't seen it within their communities and or they've had huge instances of manifestations of crises after crises. So it's a privilege for me to be engaged with something so positive. Now yeah, that's fantastic. So the UNA USA really is a positive organization and we've been around them for uh, many, many years. Uh, I like this uh, slogan that you have here, go green, grow green. But the last part of this, really intrigues me. Think like a donut. I love donuts. I try not to have them very often, but uh, go green, grow green, thrive like a donut. What does this really mean? Well, go green, uh, go green, grow green, and thrive like a, a donut is a combination of a few things. It's really uh, <clears throat> six effective ways that I say that small businesses or mid-sized businesses can um, build about sustainability. Mm -hmm. And first is by building a business of belief, a business built on belief. Mm -hmm. And that's like corporate social responsibility, right. uh, social consciousness. And so it's a sweet spot for all business cultures. And it's mm -hmm. part of the donut economy stratagems. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I mean by that. The it. second part to my six effective ways to build sustainable businesses to go green, go green and thrive like a donut is sometimes you have to actually stand still and embrace change. What do I mean by that? Oftentimes you have companies that, oh yes, we're doing a great job. We're we're, we are recycling internally, but guess what? Their practices or their business strategies don't necessarily incorporate additional green services or products. So I encourage small businesses or solo businesses or micro firms to think about how to solve solutions that's not currently in the marketplace with mm -hmm. a green edge to it. Yeah, and, that, and also to this image uh, really goes to speak to that as far as the uh, global glows are concerned. Uh, the saying uh, the development goal of number eight, why is that so important as far as the 17 sustainable development goals? 
Well, going back to the growing green, going green, you the best way to predict the future is to create it. And you have to create job opportunities and you have to give economic development to people who need it most. And what I love about the uh, goal eight specifically, it's the best way, it's the best way to bring about reinnovation and innovate, reinvention, I'm sorry, and innovation in a way that's simple. And I love to use the analogy about um, from 1986, when John S. Pemberton created the flavor syrup that we now know as Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. Coca-Cola is known globally, and Coca-Cola has to have different versions and different value-added positions from its unique contoured bottle to historical marketing campaigns. But it has continued to have a spanning portfolio of creating jobs around the world. And even today, it has billions of dollars of revenues and it drives a diverse portfolio that includes marketing, I mean, merchandising, uh, merchandising products. So it has created decent work and economic growth worldwide, not just from where it started in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Now, it's very interesting how these are uh, progressive, actionable, uh, titles for each of the 17 uh, sustainable development goals. Decent work. What does that really mean? Decent work to me is sustainability and living wages. Oftentimes mm -hmm. you have you have uh, pro progress, which is expanding a, 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 a company's uh, GDP, mm -hmm. but expanding a company's GDP is just simple growth. And so I'm going to talk about two things. Simple growth is growing, 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 growing. Mm -hmm. And um, an economy's GDP can increase by a couple percentage points. But when you look at the uh, donut economy, you go from the cycles or the stages of economic growth. Mm -hmm. So you go from the infancy stage to a more adolescent stage to a more mature stage. Mm -hmm. And then that takes me into 2050. 2050 is a such a significant year and i say that for several reasons but i can't talk about 2050 without first addressing some of the elements that we are facing right now in this health crisis mm -hmm. and i say that because 2050 uh due to 2050 we'll have an urbanization swell but currently, right now, my organization, agribiz.org, continue to expand agricultural success and training and change management and cooperative development and capacity development because of the impact of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. So in 19 in 2019, there were almost there were 130 million people who were experiencing chronic hunger and food insecurity. By the end of this year in 2020, which is approximately, uh, which I think is like 50, uh, 48 days, there will be an additional 130 million more people who will be food insecure. So that's 690 million people on the planet or one out of 10 people who are experiencing food insecurity. So in order for me to talk about 2050, um, which is a significant year, I had to t give those statistics out because in 2050, there'll be over 9 billion people on the planet. Mm -hmm. Dr. Hancock, 9 billion people. Yeah, and, and actually that's been adjusted now. They're saying we're going to have 9 billion by 2038. 2038. Right. So, yes. And uh, that's just absolutely amazing. And then just like the United States, already 80% urbanized populations but the interesting fact about this, Lady T, is that Brazil, you think of Brazil, huge country, the Amazonia, uh, you think everybody's kind of like the, the United States are out west somewhere and, and riding in this wide open territories, 89% urbanized in Brazil. So, yes. you know, that gets to really your point as far as uh, agrobiz and, and uh, .org and then also about the Global Goals Ambassador work that you're doing is that we really need to be looking today and collaborating today in order to get ready for this kind of magical 
2038 or 2050. So this constructive collaboration, what does that really mean? Well, you know, I'm agriculturalist at heart. Mm -hmm. And so to me, constructive collaborations is just like a watermelon. And I say that because my family, they love watermelons. Let me tell you, they truly love watermelons. And so constructive collaborations is like having a watermelon. But in order to go green, grow green, and thrive like a watermelon, I mean, thrive like a donut, you have to attack it like a watermelon. And I say so by you have to work with all types of stakeholders. You have mm -hmm. stakeholder engagement from nonprofits, NGOs, to commissioners, youth organization, women organizations, commodity associations, ministries, commissioners, governments, municipalities. Everyone has to be involved mm -hmm. in order to have a constructive collaboration. And so when you do so, it's like taking a watermelon seed in order to uh, to get you, you first have to take out the watermelon seed to have what I call a shared vision. Mm -hmm. And you do so by getting everybody in the room so that they can actively listen to what you have when you pull out this watermelon seed. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, you need a fertile ground. And so the fertile ground is like establishing the expectations of what you're going to do with the collaboration. Mm -hmm. And then the third piece is, uh, it's taking a watermelon and saying, okay, I have this seed, we have the fertile ground, but the next steps are we have to plant it. It's time mm -hmm. to plant it. And so it's a great representation of, of planning, implementing, and, edu and executing whatever the vision is, the shared vision. Mm -hmm. And then fourth, you have to sow the watermelon seed one inch into the soil. And that's establishing community um, engagement because if you don't engage the community, the collaboration doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then four, fifth, I say is, you know, every ground has to be watered and have cycles mm -hmm. of watering over the course of the planting season. And so stakeholder engagement is just like that. All stakeholders must keep their promises, but last, mm -hmm. but definitely not least, once the watermelon is harvested, the watermelon can be sliced and everybody can get a piece of, or a slice mm -hmm. of the watermelon. And that's what I call a constructive collaboration or right. economic that's teamwork. That's absolutely fantastic. Uh, looking at uh, moving forward with youth, uh, young girls, women, uh, you're gonna give us some examples of uh, some of the work that you're doing here. Why is it so important for you to go back uh, on the African continent and have this give back there from the United States to the African continent, but then allow the African continent and the people there to give what they have their best uh, to the United States? Well, I think there's a couple pieces to that. The first is 70% um, of the world's arable land is on the continent. And um, for me, it goes back to, as I mentioned before, it's the same group of marginalized communities, whether it's the poor women and girls or brown and black indigenous or first nations and people, persons with disabilities. They're the first to be impacted crises after crises after crises. So we need to have a new equitable and sustainable world for everyone. So that's why I have concentrated on the planet. And then another piece goes to uh, gender equality. Gender equality is very important because when we think about who the decision makers are, guess who they are? They're not necessarily women. And so women and children are the first to be impacted, but they're not necessarily at the table. So 75% of all parliamentarians are men. 73% of all managerial decision makers are men. 67% of climate negotiators are men. And 87% of people at the peace table are men. And guess what? We must improve sustainability of living wages and economic growth at the decision table. Why? Because we cannot eat coal and we cannot drink oil. Yes, that's absolutely the truth. Thank you, Lady T. Thompson, as we're looking around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Thank you for having me, sir.